Stop, stop blaming everyone and everything for your challenges. Now, it's true, they all play a role, but if you give up your power, you have no power, and now you're just floating around. So, do this. Focus on what you can control, ignore everything else. I feel like this is a uh, life tip, not just yeah. a fitness tip, but so true for fitness. So yeah, true. Needs to be brought up more these days. Absolutely. Especially. Yeah, uh, uh, victimhood is uh, a popular thing these days. It is, and it's... Um, there's some truth in it. Uh, there's some truth in, you know, the fact that society can make things hard, that you may grow up in different situations, that your genetics um, are different from other people. Um, sure. That, you, you know, just, just there's challenges that are there. So that, that's, there's some truth there. But the second you say it's, it's that fault and I can't do anything about it, well, it's, then it's true. Then you can't do anything about it. You won't do anything about it. And in my experience as a, as a trainer, um, the one thing I could never get around, the one thing I could never get around and help people with was that. If I had a client that said, it's because of my parents, it's because of society, it's because of genetics, it's, it's, you know, it's just the way it is, there was nothing I could do to help that person because they believed there was nothing that they could do. Even if they hired me, if they didn't have that attitude where they said, yeah, you know, there's definitely these challenges and stuff that's going on, but there's something I can do. Uh, at the very least, uh, there's my attitude that I can control, and that should do something. If they didn't understand that, at least that, that we were dead. We were dead in the water. Do you think there was ever a point in your life where you fell into this trap? Either oh. one of you? God, that's a good um, one. I got to think back. Yeah. I, I'm trying to think, like, specifically, but I know, like, when I was younger, it's... you. I think it's it's part of like piling on kind of when you're when you're in sort of a depressive state of mind um you start trying to find other things to to pin and 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 sort of bring that up in terms of like this isn't going well and this isn't going well so um you know all these chips are stacked against me and so it it feels kind of comforting to to, to pile on sometimes like all these factors that are going um against you and so it's like it's one of those things. It's 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 a hard spiral to get out of a lot of times because you start really kind of like stacking all these things that are not going well instead of trying to um, rationally kind of. It's it's hard to be rational when you're in an emotional state like you, that. I guess. You know, I have I have the when I think back, um, I was lucky that I started strength training so young, and I started not for great reasons. I was I had. Um, body image issues and, you know, which is a lot of reasons why people start working out. But I was 14 and I know this through training other kids. I remember when I used to train kids, when they would hire me, their parents would usually hire me to train them. I would notice their attitudes would start to change for other things outside of exercise. And so because I started so early and it was all focused on fitness at that time, right? It was just about working out. But I said, okay, I want to develop this. I'm going to work on that. I suck at this exercise. I'm going to keep working at it. If it's this isn't working, I'm going to keep trying other things. I think that gave me a lot of carryover. My challenge was, this is also another challenge. My challenge was not thinking I could control everything. That was a tough thing for me. It's like uh, accepting that, okay, there's some things that are out of my out of my hands. So I just got to accept that. That's that, that was a little bit more personal, I would say. But, you know, working with uh, clients that just, they gave up that control for themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like, you know, they're, I'm, a, I'm overweight because of my genetics and, uh, there's nothing I can do about it. It's like, well, there's a lot of things you can well, do about it. And, and, but, but yeah, if you believe that there's nothing you can do about it, there is, there's nothing yeah. you can do about it. I think that was a terrible generic answer I gave. I, I, I'll give one a little more specific. Like, I think I, to the point where I, I want, I fled. So instead of like addressing something I could address, like I ended up like moving across the country to mm. kind of like avoid my oh, problems. Yeah. So that was, that was something I felt like a victim. I felt like, you I know, definitely did that. Too, I was so in that, this yeah. state where Good everything point. was going wrong and like, I just have to get out of here and leave. And, and it was just, it kind of drove me away from family, friends and all that and kind of reinvent myself when in fact, if I just stayed there and like addressed all these things and yeah, like, yeah dealt with it, I would have been in a much better place. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Adam? Yeah, no, I mean, there's uh, one in particular comes to mind for me. I think everybody does. I really do. I think at one point, everybody experiences, it's hard not to, especially when things are true, right? So for example, like my situation, like um, 
that, and I think that's when this is most challenging when the the thing that you feel a victim about is has a, a lot of truth to it to still not feel that way it doesn't matter right so you know for years I worked for a, a boss who took a lot of credit for the things that I that I did and and didn't um, you know celebrate my wins or or tell the upper management that it was my idea or the things that we were doing. Mm. And I say a lot of times that I stayed at 24, 24 hour fitness about four out of four hours, four years later than I should have. Um, when I should have known it was, it was time to move on. And for many years, uh, I, I blamed my boss because these, these behaviors were true. He was really doing this. He was taking credit for a lot of the things that I was coming up with, or I was doing, I was, uh, regardless of what uh, success I was having within my own personal club, I was also developing all these other leaders. And I just really felt that he selfishly was keeping me as it. And by the way, understandably, like uh, if I'm his top performer and he's, let's say he's got 10, 10 guys underneath him and the 10 of us run these clubs, we're, a, we, we directly affect his paycheck. And so, and I'm one of the best at what I did and I was running his biggest clubs, I was affecting his paycheck. So it was in his best interest to keep me in that position and, and not allow me to get yeah. promoted. Because if I got promoted and moved on, he no longer had this, this mm -hmm. horse. And I knew that, you know, and it was obvious. And so for many years, I, I was angry about it, you know, and had this attitude of like, fuck this, fuck the system. This is bullshit. Like, that he's oppressing me and holding me in this position and really didn't do anything about it. And it, I, I remember literally like waking up one day and going like, wait a second, like this all has to do with my growth in business, right? Like he's, he's keeping me in this place. I can't continue to climb the ladder and elevate. And I remember blaming him, blaming the company, blaming the, the way the system was, mm. was set up and, uh, and felt that way for a really long time until one day I kind of snapped out of it and realized, wait a second, I'm allowing one man or one company to dictate my future by giving them this much power to believe that they really have that much say in my, my growth. And at that moment, I thought, wait a second, what's to stop me from continuing to, to learn as much as the CEO or the vice presidents of this company have Instead of, you know, blaming this guy for not elevating me and what what's to stop me from seeking out the education and and learning myself and and then giving my the skill sets that I get so smart, so good at what I'm doing that either one, he's forced to, to push me up the ladder and or the, or I become so valuable that I have so many other places and options to go shop my skill sets around. And that, that was, that's when I became a, a big reader. I was not a big reader at all up until that point. Um, I, in fact, I hated reading. And that was the first way that I gained that power back is I was like, okay, I'm going to go educate myself. I'm going to go seek out everything the, the, the founder is reading and learn everything that I can that, that he's, he's learned. And so now, do you remember how you how it felt when you when you pieced that together, like the feeling you had? Oh yeah, no, it was a, it was a very aha moment for me. It really was. What am I doing? You know, I'm because I really tried to unpack like what is it that I want so much that that next level? Well, of course, I want the pay raise, I want the title, the accolades, things like that. But it's like, why am I allowing this person to say whether I can or can't move up in life? Uh, because I, at that point, like I had ident I identified so much as this, this boss or manager within this company. It's like, why, why did I not think bigger mm -hmm. and outside of that and, and start to do things that would, that I could control, which was educating myself. And then I, and the way I looked at it was like, man, I could get so good at this. You can't deny me. You can't, you won't be able to deny me or in that pursuit of getting that educated, that someone else would find me, swoop me up, and I'd go get paid somewhere else. Yeah, I think the, the myth is that because it is alluring to give up that control because taking responsibility can feel like it's going to be heavy. But the truth is when you have that moment, that aha moment like you did, it doesn't feel heavy. It feels uh, light. You feel empowered like you have wings. And and this is the the, the myth. People are like, well, if, if, I, if I take responsibility – 
it's going to feel terrible. It feels so much easier just to say it's everybody else's fault. And that's why I'm doing it this way. And that's why I'm acting this way. Mm -hmm. No, it's heavier to feel that. It's like the myth of exercise and eating right is hard. It's actually not hard. It's harder to be unhealthy. So it's also a false belief that it's harder to do that. It's not empowerment feels great. It does take responsibility, which is scary, which is true. So it does take a little bit of bravery, but it actually feels really good. You know, it's what, what brought this up for me was that post you showed us from, and I, I want to be very careful here because I respect this person. This individual has, uh, they're very smart. They have really good posts, mm. exceptional athlete. So I have a lot of respect for this individual, but they did a post that um, exemplifies exactly kind of what we're talking about. So it's uh, Steffi Cohn. Oh yeah, the the risque photo that she took. Yeah, and then she said that she feels pressured to have to post, you know, less and less clothes. And I, you know, one, I think it's an interesting post. I'm sure it got her desired outcome, which was attention. Yeah, maybe. attention, engagement, and in the conversation, which is, I read some of the comments and I read her response, and that was what she she claims her. Yeah, she's very smart, great her, information. Her desired outcome was to to start a conversation around something, but. Um, the truth is that, um, you know, you know, you may feel that pressure, but that a pressure isn't a, an, an external force. You are uh, applying that pressure on yourself. That's yeah. your own shit. Yeah. So the picture is, it's a picture of her, her back and she's got like a, you know, small, looks like lingerie on. And it says, I feel pressure to show more skin than I'm comfortable with, which is ironic. On, it's because it's on a picture of her butt. And then the and, caption. And then the caption says, if you tell me I shouldn't feel pressured, you just don't get it, respectfully. Now, um, here's here's the, the part of this that's uh, frustrating to read for me, is that she's a fitness expert. She understands pressure very well. She feels pressure to eat like garbage. She feels pressure to not be active. She feels pressure to not have the disciplined exercise every single day, yet she does it. Yet mm -hmm. she does it. So let's just change this, for example. Imagine it's a picture of an obese person. And it says, uh, I feel pressured to eat junk food and not move. Right? How would she respond to that? Mm -hmm. So instead, she does this, which to me feels like an excuse to post a picture of your butt and then to kind of apologize for it. But yet here it is type of deal. And the comments were largely negative. I think a lot of people on there were like, well, you don't have to do any of this. Right. Yeah. And if you do, by the way. That's yourself, man. Then go ahead and do it. But why say that right there? So the thing about that's frustrating about this is when fitness people pr preach about e external pressures and forces, and this is just the way it is, and this is why I got to do it. Yet they can they can show discipline in other areas. It's the same thing. Listen, there's yeah, a, it's, we, it's the same thing. There's the same. Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, we're not. A and I'm not. Look, I'm not. We're not, we're not a, a, a sexy girl. Uh, so our, our pressure is different, but, the, but Hey, the, the pressure is the same though. There's the same pressure for us to use our bodies to post. When I post, when I was posting images of me with my shirt off, flexing and posing, that gets way more traffic than uh, a regular old ass post that we put up there. Mm -hmm. So that's saying, and then, and every, and people would love to see all of our workouts and people would love to see the motivational and hype stuff. We choose not to. And uh, you could argue that it potentially hurts the growth of the business. And so there is that pressure of, hey, if we're if our goal is to scale and build yeah. this thing, isn't it in our best interest to do these posts? But we choose not to because we don't want to. Yeah. Because I, 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 one, I don't want to feel like I forever have to do that. I, yeah. I don't think any of us want to have to do that. I also recognize, though, the, the value of it as a strategy when I first started growing the, the Instagram. It was like when we had no following or traction whatsoever. I knew, okay, this was gaining attention. I also recognized the type of intention, uh, uh, attention that it was attracting. And I knew that, well, you know, once we got to a point where the podcast was bigger than my social media platform, there was no need to try and garner any Look, attention. It's not even, this isn't even an issue with posting pictures of yourself doing whatever. I mean, it, it could be part of your strategy. It could not. Steffi's got, she's very smart. A lot of the information she posts is very, very intelligent, very good. So it's not like she built her business around this. No. And if you do whatever, that's up to you type of deal. I'm not, that's not the issue. And, and I'm not also saying that uh, I'm perfect. I don't have issues with my own challenges. I've talked about it many times on the podcast. That's not the issue. The issue is uh, presenting it and then saying, um, you know, I feel pressured to do this. Here you go. Here it is. It's like, um, 
it'd be like you know someone who's a, a drug addict and then saying, "Here I am doing drugs, but that's because it's so hard and everybody's telling me to do it." And it's like what well, you're, you're presenting this kind of this this weird um, right. counter message to what you're actually doing when you are you know what discipline's like, you know what pressure's right. like. If you're a fit person, look first off, if you're fit. If you're lean and you're disciplined with exercise, you are not the average. You are not succumbing to the pressure of society. The average person eats garbage and doesn't move. You you stand out. You're weird in the sense that you're not like everyone else. So if you give into the pressure of something, you know what it feels like to not give into the pressure. Uh, so if you're talking about this and you're saying, "Hey, uh, you know, I got you know, as a woman, I feel pressured to post pictures of myself." You yeah. know, half naked. Well, I, wonder, I get that. I get that. But you posted it on a picture of yourself half naked, which is kind of like, uh, like, and there's a lot yeah. of negative comments. I, I was trying to think of, and, and I know like in terms of like showing body, like that's definitely, uh, you know, if we're, we're talking about like the, the male version of that, I think a more closely related one would be the fake weights thing. Oh, and so in terms of like, like me being machismo and like the, the guy that's the hero always yeah. like having like it, it, guys, you know, what if they just posted, like, I just did this PR and it's like a 500 pound bench press or something, but you find out it's like fake weights on there or whatever. But I had to, because like, they expect me to, yeah. uh, yeah, to, to lift this crazy weight all the time. And it's just like, uh, you, I think we just, we find ourselves creating these false narratives in our own mind a lot of times too, like where it's like, you expect this out of me and you like, I, like I, I try to read what you're thinking about me all the time. And it's like, where do we just create these things like internally when in fact, like if you actually ask your audience more of like what they want, I bet you'd be surprised. Like that's not even like, well, what I think she's, after. I think she's trying to highlight what's wrong with our space is that, you know, we're, we're here. She is this, this really intelligent PhD who does put incredible content but then the the feedback is that she gets way more likes, views, and stuff where it's on its okay. And, and and I think she's trying to highlight that. Sure. But the and and I, I guess that you're trying to highlight it because you hope that you change it or shift it in a different direction, which I think is a, a losing battle. It's like sex is is a thing that's always been. Yeah, all, but she could have done that without a popular. picture of her of herself. No, you're half right. Naked. I, I, that's right. The, that's the temptation to want to do that, right? Because there's a, also the side of that you get the validation. You feel good. You look good. It's like searching for compliments. I get that. Yeah, you know, yes, yeah. I get it. There's yeah. a, there's a there's a part of the of you that that feels good to to do that. Of course. So that's a way to to present that that information. It's, like here's that. what it is. We're all mm. imperfect. We're all human. There's there's only one perfect person ever walked the, the face of the earth. Okay, so we're all imperfect. We all have challenges. Um, I think uh, it's uh, it, it, it's important. Well, it's look, and again, I've, I'm sure I've done this too. It's better to put yourself out there and say, "Here's my challenge," and that's it. And that's that. So rather than uh, countering your message with the with the very thing that you're talking about, you know, it's like I'm fighting drug abuse by doing drugs. What? Right. That doesn't make any sense. Well, there's a big disconnect with that in terms of like promoting discipline and all these other aspects. And then this is like a you know what it reminds me of? Here's it's like this. Here. It's like the people in the fitness space because this is very popular in the fitness space. It's like people in the fitness space who are all about discipline with diet and nutrition and exercise. And then they're like, but it's so natural to ha to sleep with everybody you want to have sex with. That's why I advocate for these relationships Polygamy. where you just sleep with everybody because it's natural. It's also natural to not want to exercise and eat garbage, but you don't do that. Yeah. So you understand <laughs> that there's a benefit. <laughs> you have a to little having, bit of self-control. Yeah. You know, so in this regard, yeah, but, it's like yeah. weird, you know, like, like uh, our space can sometimes be very, well, not sometimes, oftentimes is not a healthy space. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a vanity space. And that can be for, you know, a bit frustrating. Attention. I mean, like it's, this is, we're always going to battle all this stuff. Cause like, it, again, it, it draws attention, draws a conversation. It's like, it, this is, this is what social media is. It's just like finding an angle as people are going to be like, whoa, either you're going to piss them off or you're just going to be provocative on some level. Yeah. I mean, w when discussions like this and, and, and influencers that are attached to their social media, it, it makes me it makes me excited about uh, the vision that we had from the very beginning of, of building and doing this thing. Like, 
Um, Turning it off? Yep. Yeah. I mean, that uh, to me, yeah. it was just like- <laughs> Totally, dude. I, I don't think a lot of these uh, influencers get in the space with a similar type of, of vision. I mean, we, we wanted that before we even had anybody paying attention or following, we knew that the ultimate goal was to get there to build a, a business around it. To use it. it as a tool. That's right. And Turn then, it off. And then to, to remove ourselves from it because- um, no, I, I think that with all the great positive things that, it, that it, it comes with it, so do a lot of negative things. And if you can find a way to utilize it as a tool and, and reap the benefits of all the positive things that come with, uh, having a social media presence and, uh, remove all the negative, like that's where you're really winning. And I think the, the strategy of doing that is to build up a legitimate business and then pull yourself. Cause here's the deal. If you have a legit good business that takes care of people uh really really well like and you've built that up it, that will that will co continue That's sustainable it's very Always. sustainable like you don't you don't we don't none of us have to have uh to get on i mean social media didn't there's plenty of businesses that exist that don't have big names on instagram yeah. or big name like there's plenty of great businesses and companies out there you know what the other just happens to be an effective tool today to get attention and in eyes fact, and most of the businesses or people we've met in the space they're like not even that visibly popular right no. you're like wow and i can't believe this guy's killed because they built a great yeah. business yeah. Yeah. and then there's people that are very popular that don't have a business out of this popularity and then there's also this this is this yeah. is also very true money isn't everything yeah. it just isn't Money is, I mean, you need to have it and it can buy you freedom and it can buy you time with your family. Um, so I'm not saying money isn't anything, but money isn't everything. And it, you sell yourself and you sell your soul for money. You'll find yourself in a, in hell. You really will find yourself in hell. And you don't believe me. Look at the suicide rate with these celebrities that just, it's through the roof. They, they commit suicide at rates and their drug abuse at rates that mirror people in extreme poverty. And you think, how's that possible? They have all this money, all this access? Because it's hell. It's hell to be loved for being not you. Yeah. It's hell to provide something that's giving people not value. Like, imagine if you were a billionaire because you sold products that gave people cancer. Like, uh, I don't know. I guess you'd have to really be an evil person for that not to bother you. It would bother me at some point. Like, man, I'm making all this money. You know the story of um, the heir to the Winchester fortune? You guys know this because we yeah. have the Winchester mystery oh, house yeah. here. So she, obviously she was heir to like millions and millions of dollars because her husband, I think it was, invented the Winchester repeating rifle. Mm -hmm. And she thought that she was going to be haunted yeah. for all the deaths that the her guilt caused. The guilt associated with that was, was surmountable for her. Yeah, and I mean, it killed her. The, yeah. the house that she built, so big. There's a house up here in the Bay Area called the Winchester Mystery House. And it's so big and there's rooms that lead to nowhere and staircases that lead to nowhere. And it's so strange because she believed that she would get haunted by all the spirits of the people that her gun, that the guns killed and she, she lost money. So she thought if she kept building, kept building rooms for them to go, that the, that the spirits wouldn't be able to right, find yeah. her. That's the story. Behind Is that it. the philosophy behind why the rooms are all weird? Yeah. yeah. Is she it, just would keep building uh, to keep her safe, keep her safe. Yeah. A couple <laughs> from, steps from ahead the, from of the, the curse spirits. or the evil, you know, <laughs> all these spirits that were trying to find her because of this Winchester gun <laughs> that ended up, you know, that killed so many people. Uh, yeah, pretty yeah, nuts. So. What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway is MAPS Split. Here's how you can win that program. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, we've put together a new workout program bundle and discounted it heavily. Only going on for this month, by the way. It's just a limited time offer. Here's what it is. MAPS 15 minutes. MAPS anywhere. Maps Prime, and then we have an ebook called Eat to Perform. They're all in this bundle called the Time Crunch Bundle, and it's priced $99.99. That's a discount of over $200. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Did anyway, you? I got some I got some cool uh, facts on Bruce Lee that I just read about. On Bruce Lee? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what he's Dude, hit like. it. Hit us Dude, he it. was uh he was pretty remarkable. I'll pull these up for you. So I've told you guys about um how he could generate so much power with the sidekick. There's videos of him doing this. He had a I think a 300 pound heavy bag. He had this specially made heavy bag. Yeah. And he would be able to kick it hard enough to fold it in half and have it swing up and hit the top of the okay. rafters. And he what? would often do this to demonstrate to people that would come over his house. Is there some kind of chart? Because 
okay there's so many like urban legends around him and like i feel like like so many things like you saw that video with him and the nunchucks that playing ping fake. pong yeah so exactly there's like some of them are like obviously doctored. Some of them yeah, are like just real said stories. That is very unbelievable to this me. Song, it's on video. A three hundred. Well, so was the nunchucks with ping pong here. So a three hundred no, 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 pound no, no. That was bag. Made recently with the a three hundred pound <laughs> bag kicked, folded in half, and swung up towards like he the would rafters. Kick it and it would swing up to the rafters. I mean, maybe Doug could look it up. Um, yeah, so here's some other stuff. He also could take a one hundred pound dumbbell uh, and hold it yeah, out hold at it arm's length. Yeah. I've heard that because he had tremendous um, static. Isometric yeah, strength. Range strength. He trained with Bill Pearl, who was a bodybuilder who taught him strength training. He learned footwork uh, from Muhammad Ali. That's why his style of Kung Fu. Now, worked. have you seen a, a video of him actually holding the dumbbell out? Never like that? saw that, but okay. that was something that lots of celebrities, Hollywood celebrities would see him do when they did the green Hornet. So he was, that was the first TV thing that he did. Yeah. The green Hornet. He was uh Cato. Yeah. The guy with the mask on or whatever. So funny. He was the sidekick. I know. Like, Come on. Dude. He, they, they had to make him slow down. Because he was too fast on camera. Yeah. And the, the director's like, you need to slow down your, your kicks and your moves because you're too fast. So here's another thing he did. He could do 50 one-arm, one-handed push-ups with his thumb and index finger. So he would put his thumb and index finger out like this, and he would do 50 push-ups in a row. Uh, he could throw, he could catch a grain of rice with chopsticks. That one, they've, they, what? Of people, yeah, I talked about that as well. Uh, oh, here, here here's one him. Kicking a 700 pound bag. Is that what that says, Doug? That's what it says. <laughs> yeah. So pretty cool. I love, I love reading shit like that. Um, <laughs> That's not so. That can't be 700 pounds. I don't think it's 700 there's pounds. No, there's no, no way. Yeah. It's probably a 200 pound bag. Yeah. But there's, uh, there's some pretty insane. That's a movie. That's what you yeah. call it. Chuck Norris. <laughs> Chuck I love Norris. that. That's one of my favorite uh, scenes. You ever watch that? Bro. No, I don't know. That's Chuck that. Norris had just as impressive of a stat. That's man. a real kick right there. Stuff. Did you see that kick that yeah. he did on the, on the guy? So apparently hey, hey. he kicked the guy so hard he broke his ribs. So wasn't he like kick a full force. kickboxing champion? Like he has a pedigree like Chuck Norris does. Ch oh, Chuck Norris was a real legit fighter. Yeah. Like so he, Chuck he Norris. He real legit fights. Yeah. So when they interviewed Chuck Norris afterwards, I guess him and Bruce were sparring. And he was like, oh, yeah. He goes, he's legit as fast as, as they say he is. That was Return of the Dragon. I would love to interview Chuck Norris about Bruce Lee. Yeah. That, Where that is would be Chuck interesting. Norris? Huh? Where is Chuck Norris? Dude, he's still killing it. I mean, he he's old, obviously, but well, like he, he him looks and, in great him shape. Him and David Hasselhoff have to be the two most popular memes ever, right? Yeah. Like, the, like there's more things... And what, what do you think that is? I mean, I think David Hasselhoff is because of his... He's just legendary. ...world-renowned fame, right? But what oh, is, yeah. is... Yeah. Bruce Lee was because he was the one to really popularize kung fu movies. There's the dragon flag. That's the... That's the then Rocky did that, of course. Yeah. That was his ab exercise. Well, he practice. was the first to really demonstrate strength with the martial arts. You know, like he, he incorporated this crazy physique and also like he, he combined martial art disciplines. Right? Yeah. So he, so this is a. Did you read any books on him when you were younger? Yeah. I read the Tao of, uh, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, which is the, the philosophy of his martial art that he created. Okay. So he, he was the first mixed martial artist. Real mixed martial artist. There he yeah. is doing that push-up I was telling you about. Yeah. See with the index finger and thumb? Yeah. Pretty okay, crazy, so right? That's at a karate demonstration. At that same demonstration, he demonstrated his one-inch punch and knocked the dude, it flew, the guy flew back okay. into a chair. So let's get a little conspiratorial now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how, about his death? Yes. About his, and then also his son, Brandon yeah, Lee, dude. right? And like- Wasn't he shot playing him in a movie or something like that? I don't know if he was playing the him. crow. No, right? it was part two. The yeah. Crow. It, oh, it wasn't playing. So was this because I've heard that it's somewhat related to this? Um, not uh, what, what's the the mafia gang over in um, China or Hong Kong? Oh. The triad. The triad. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was somewhat related to the triad because of him bringing so here's mar story. martial arts over to the United States. Here's the story. Okay, so kung fu was very protected yeah. among the Chinese community. You are not allowed to teach this to anybody who's not Chinese. Plus, it was very structured and very traditional. Bruce Lee learned traditional Kung Fu, but also studied other martial arts. So he's like the first, like I said, the first mixed martial artist. He watched judo, uh, Western boxing, uh, he liked the footwork of Western, but he often talked about watching uh, Muhammad Ali mm -hmm. and examining his footwork, uh, kickboxing, 
um, Aikido. So he would look at all these different martial arts and he said these rigid forms. So if you read the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, I, have the, I, I read like 10 when I was a kid. I used to read it all the time. If you, he said that the, the, the best fighting style should be formless. So really he was talking about mixed martial arts. And he started teaching in San Francisco anybody who wanted to learn. Yeah. Well, the Chinese let Westerners come in. Yeah, yeah. The Chinese community got a hold, heard this and sent some representatives to him and said, you, you got to stop teaching uh, Westerners. You're so not allowed to teach Westerners. That's one of the theories around his death was that because he was teaching Kung Fu. It to, gets better. Uh, so they sent, so he said, no, I'm going to teach whoever the hell I want this martial art. So they, so they issued a challenge. We will send you our top fighter against you. And if you lose, you leave San Francisco and never teach again. And he goes, if I win, then I'll teach Westerners. And they said, fine. So he fought their top fighter and he won. Uh, by the way, afterwards, he was so, the story goes, he was exhausted afterwards. And this is what got him into physical fitness. Mm -hmm. So after that, he says, you know what? I won, but my physical fitness kind of got in the way. So then he learned strength training from Bill Pearl. He learned how to do isometric training. You know, the, the stim machines that every 10 years comes back is the new thing or whatever. Yeah. He would use those while writing. So he'd be writing and the thing would make his like chest pump. But he did everything. He was into supplements. He learned from Jack LaLanne. Oh. And that's how he developed. Because if you watch early Bruce Lee, he was not super shredded like he was when he did Enter the Dragon. When he did Enter the Dragon, he had the abs and all that stuff. So the story goes that they still wanted him to stop. And so he was poisoned, is what they say. Oh, is how he ended up getting killed. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> anyway. No one's cool ever been able to confirm that though, huh? No. And no. I thought, so I thought his son in The Crow was playing his dad. No. Like he wasn't the part or the role. And I don't remember that. And I don't remember exactly no, how that. I think the story of The Crow is like some dude that like gets killed, but then comes back after Yeah, death that's to... the main character. But I think what uh, Brandon, it's Brandon Lee, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The role he, because he didn't play the main role, right? He played something else. No, he was the main role. Oh, he was the he main was role? The crow oh, guy. okay. Mm -hmm. So I thought he was something else. Yeah, though. that was sad. I don't remember yeah. that one. I was sad about that. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of legend and lore around, you know, all that stuff. So it's yeah. interesting. Anyway, I want to talk about a superfood that uh, nobody wants to eat, but we have a way now of getting people to the superfood. Do you guys know? Okay, so fish roe. Fish roe has to be one of the most nutrient dense, healthy foods on the planet. Fish eggs. Fish eggs. Oh. Very high in uh, nutrients like selenium, uh, zinc, A, D. See, for me, it just looks like bait. <laughs> I guess, I guess it is. <laughs> I just grew up fishing, and that's what we used for. We call them redhead yeah. step omega three fatty acids. Uh, obviously, worms. where does where does, yeah. where does uh, caviar fall in that category? That is what that is. Yeah, is. So, so that's so that's what it that's is. That's a type of version. Yeah. Okay, so is it and how? I mean, where does it fall? Is it like the highest quality of that? Is it? I think oh, mid grade. I think is, caviar is like the tastiest because yeah. you could buy salmon roe for way cheaper. Yeah. But I think caviar is like the tastiest, most Doug's expensive. Doug's a big caviar guy. He like eats caviar every morning and... for breakfast. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Right. see him in his lunch. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jessica, in fact, when she was pregnant, she used to eat a, a, a teaspoon of, ca of uh, roe every day because of the health benefits for the baby. So is it better than the fish oil? It's, uh, it doesn't have as many of the EPA fatty acids because it's not pure oil, but it has other nutrients like selenium, D, a, I think, uh, maybe Doug could look it up. Um, some of the nutrients in fish oil are, it's considered a superfood. It really is. Vitamin B12, D. Um, it's connected to reducing uh, the risk of things like Alzheimer's, dementia. So would you take it in combination with your fish oil? Or would you take it in replace of? Is it totally different? I mean, if you're supplementing with fish oil because you need omega-3s, I would still continue doing it. Uh, fish roe, I would put in a category of like organ meats like to give you those extra beneficial nutrients. Mm, the problem is sense. most people don't want to eat fish roe. Right. So the reason why I bring this up, Paleo Valley now has uh, this, which is the wild caught fish roe freeze, freeze dried. So you can literally- Oh, freeze dried. Yeah. So it's- Capsules. Capsules. Okay. Capsules. So you can take like five, six of these a day. And you've, it's like you're eating. So uh, your weenies like me that get a little squeamish. That's can, uh, exactly. Take it down. <laughs> 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 yeah, so just right use me as an example because yeah. I would definitely prefer that. Yeah, yeah. So you take. I, oh, it smells like that. Oh, it's fish roll. Yeah, it's oh, definitely fish roll. Go for smell. I, no. wait, I wonder if this, <laughs> don't don't be kissing Sal after that. <laughs> Will this do like you know? Not again. What, one thing I don't like <laughs> about some um, some fish oils. Not all of them are like this. Some fish oils they repeat on you. They, what'd you say? Repeat on you? Is that what that's called? Yeah, you burp and you yeah, taste yeah. it. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's called repeating? Uh-huh. Oh, I didn't know mm. that. Yeah. 
That was new to you, me. You got to freeze them. Yeah, no, I know you're, you're the one who taught me that. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I never did that before. But yeah, that's the worst. Like you, like four hours later, so you do a burp and you're like, Ugh. oh, yeah. Will gross. that fish roll be like that? You think unpleasant nope. present? Oh, it won't be like no, that. No, I've been taking those. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I have I have a couple bottles at home. I've been taking them every morning, and I love them. Oh yeah, yeah, they're really good for you. Anyway, yeah. speaking of burping and stuff, Justin, you have yet to talk about the lady in the Whoa. restaurant that died, oh that yeah. almost died. Oh dude, I, that I was need last to hear about week. this. Yeah, it was intense. It was. So we were just going out for um, dinner, and um, I think um, so. We, we were at this new restaurant that was like uh, in Scotts Valley, and um, just mind our own business. And this lady over to the right of us, literally like one table across from us. Um, were you with the kids too? No, thank God. So it was, it was one of those weird things where it was like we're just kind of. It was just everything's normal, and then you just kind of felt something in the air that was like off, and you're just kind of looking around like what's going on. And I just look over the corner of my eye, and I see this lady like over bent over like her chair, and this guy like gets up and just starts like doing the Heimlich maneuver and like hammering her stomach and getting. Um, and it started to get intense because it wasn't working. And this is where it was like, it went from like, oh, wow, there's like a situation, but you know, usually you get some resolve, like it, in some kind of like uh, item flies out or whatever. And I don't know if you guys, I, I wanted to talk about this because I don't know if you guys been in like kind of like a crisis situation like this, where it was like, dude, this is like life or death. Like, so she started turning blue and it was like, oh. how so long the, was this happening? So, I mean, again, it, it probably wasn't as long as it felt, right? So it felt like it was like five, 10 minutes long. It was probably like a minute uh, <sighs> worth of of um, maneuvers. And finally, like she she finally like bent over and like spit something out and then kind of started to recover. But <laughs> Courtney was already on the phone, already called 911. <laughs> it was like, you know, kind of right there. This lady right next to us was... Uh, had a medical background as well. And so she was like, you know, all anticipated. But thankfully, like her son was the one that like helped save her life. Uh, he was just going through uh, like this um, firefighter uh, paramedic um, course. And so he was, it was all fresh for him. And so he was doing like the perfect job uh, that he could do, uh, giving her the maneuver. It just Dude, wasn't she working. Died. She would have died. She, and she was like, and it, it was at that point where you could hear a pin drop, like in the restaurant, everybody had stopped and like, was like paying Bro, attention. That's intense. But I was like, cause I've had that happen before when I was at a restaurant and it was outside and this lady was choking. And, um, but at that point, nobody really stepped up and knew what to do. And I just, I saw it like from the other side of the restaurant and I like ran over there and just grabbed her and just started doing it. And, um, you did it. Yeah, this was a long time ago. Like I did that with did this you save lady, your life? save your life. Yeah, but I had it. It, it was so um, the adrenaline was so crazy. That I had to like go sit in the cooler for like an hour just to recover because it was just after it was all done, I couldn't even like uh, pull myself together. Like I lost my shit, dude. Wow, because it was just like it's so much different when somebody's gonna die. You know, like w when the stakes are like like that, and so I was telling Courtney, I was like, I could never do the medical no way job. I couldn't get in that field for that reason because it just it it took so much out of me. Like, and I was like, because I was empathizing with with this son having to save his mom's life, like right in front of us, and it was like so intense, dude. Oh my god! So I had, yeah. I had a I had a girlfriend in high school who was a lifeguard. And uh, this guy had uh, a heart attack on the plane and she ended up doing like CPR for like 30 minutes until they landed and the dude died. Oh, oh that and I was sucks. like, man, I can't like just, I remember yeah. and that stuck with me forever. Just like, that would be just. Bro, I almost, almost. You're we, trying everything you can. And yeah. The, yeah. No, uh, we, we pulled a guy out of the, the jacuzzi because he was like passed out and we had to pull him out and they already called 911, my front desk. And we're checking him. You're doing all the stuff you're supposed to do. Is he breathing? Check his pulse or whatever. And I, there was a moment where I was like, I'm going to have to do fucking CPR. Boom. Paramedics walk in right at that moment. I'm like, thank God. Take over. <laughs> yeah. Because that's some. You know, the, so the, and I, it, that is some which is why shit. Courtney probably did what she did. You know that I seen one time the, the probability of, of saving somebody's life in an emergency like that. Like the, what are the like top three, like what you can do? Mm -hmm. Like nine, calling 911 is like increases their chances higher than, than anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How fast you yeah. can get on the phone. 
because every second matters in a, in a situation like that. So you pondering, oh God, what should I do? Oh, is more dangerous than like yeah, instantly getting, time lost. Yes, yeah. like getting on the phone, calling, getting someone there who's a professional yeah. because there is a chance that you can't do anything, and then you resort to the. And then I think CPR is. Well, the next yeah, thing she and, told me even then because like I, I, I was like thinking because he wasn't getting any resolve from his original ones. I was like, I was even thinking of like, oh, let me give it a shot, you know? And like, I was going to give some real um, rib breaking um, yeah. uh, maneuvers. And, and she's like, no, 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 no. Like the next move from there was a CPR. Yeah. And, and I was Holy like, I would have totally fucked that up. Yeah. Having an AED. Cause remember when gyms, we never had AEDs in them and then they made them like a requirement. Mm -hmm. Apparently an AED um, significantly improves the survivability when somebody has a cardiac arrest. Yeah, that's another one too. I, re I remember I, I saw I, a great chart on because like I own my wellness studio and then they had passed a law at some point where I had to buy one, which of course pissed me off. So I'm oh, yeah, and you look yeah, at yeah. statistics actually, uh, it's a big deal. And uh, and then with kids, choking is a big deal, oh, yeah. which is why I bought those. Uh, I showed you guys those little <sighs> things you put on a kid's mouth. Oh, you, did you get one? I have them. I have, I have one for adults and one for kids and one for infants, uh, not for infants, young kids in a drawer in the kitchen because uh you know what you know scary shit sometimes i don't look at because then it just makes me paranoid yeah. but i saw this i was scrolling through facebook and there was a like a there was this ad it got me it was like this little kid with the mom and then it mm -hmm. showed like a like a piece of candy like you know and it's like this almost killed and i'm like oh you know and i got two little ones uh, so i'm like gosh damn it you dude. guys got me so i looked it up i'm like just buy them Put them in the house just in case, you know? No, I mean, that happened when Courtney was at work and, and Ethan was eating, um, like, a really hot uh, chicken nugget. And and I think, too, this lady was the same thing. It was, like, the Brussels sprouts. The irony was, like, we ordered Brussels sprouts. I'm, like, eating through the Brussels sprouts. <laughs> she just ate was like, oh, oh. I'm, like, oh, no. Like, but it's the it was it came out real hot, like like steamy hot. Like, and so I, I think she didn't wait, you know, to where uh. it, 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 you know, had – where it like it, it shocked her like she yeah. oh, like oh and then like breathed it in and so then it like oh wow. so that's what happened with ethan too he like he bought into it and it shocked he's like oh that's hot and then ha oh, oh, and then breathed it oh and interesting it into the windpipe and so that's that that was like something i wonder if that's you, common yeah because you didn't you don't you think that like it's just a big piece you ate you didn't chew it down enough or yeah or whatever, no, it does, it's the wrong pipe it's the wrong it's went in the wrong yeah, bro, choking is one of the number one. Uh, so is that what, children. is that what's most common? Then is that it, it just goes down the wrong pipe? It's not a matter of it getting lodged. I thought it was always like getting lodged. No, but. no, that you don't choke from that. Yeah. It, oh, it, I didn't know that. If you get stuck, I, in I assume where like someone blocks your choking on food. Breathing. It's just because it's a big. No, piece. no. If it gets stuck where you swallow food, yeah. that's bad too, and you'll throw up and stuff. But you can breathe. You can still breathe. I had a cousin that happened to. He got a piece of meat stuck mm -hmm. and, and he couldn't swallow. He'd throw up. They took him to the hospital and they had to pull it out. It's when it goes in the air pipe. Yeah. That is when it's bad. Oh, it, so if I you can hear that. if you can yeah. hear coughing, yeah, yeah. Then then they're not, it's not in the air pipe. It's when you hear nothing and they just look at you yeah, like they, this and they're yeah. Like they're they're just deprived of breathing at all. Yes. Yeah, it's brutal. That's that kind of show. Oh wow. Yeah. I just yeah. assumed that it was like always like a piece of food that was too big and it got lodged no. in your throat like that. Yeah. It's actually gone into the window. Dude, I grabbed it and put wow. it on my knee and just <laughs> <laughs> PT. Like he wasn't was, even. I just immediately like, and, and he was bigger, so it was like you know I could have done the regular maneuver, but I just grabbed him and and then he, he coughed it out. That, but, that oh my, my god! My biggest fear out. as a dad uh, to date is that of is like Katrina and Max being upstairs. I'm downstairs and I hear like the scream, like the like the oh the, the scary scream. Yeah, like Katrina yelling, like I've never heard her yell before, and just yeah. not even knowing and having to get up there and stuff like that. Like it's it's a weird thought. But it, it Dude, this whole conversation, I'm sweating right now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like ready to move on. I have yeah. enough yeah. trauma. To I'll, well, I'll give you some positive stuff. Yeah. I, it, I, I told you, you guys about when I ripped the railing yeah. off the wall yeah, because yeah, my son yeah. almost fell down yeah, the stairs. Yeah. yeah I literally yeah. ripped the rich yeah. to try and get to him. Oh, I don't All right. Speaking something. of our yeah. children, though, that yeah. on a positive Let's go happy stuff. Yeah. My son <laughs> is uh, such a, a fun, funny phase right now with um you know he's he just says stuff that you never hear him say before and when he says it it's like comical we're laying in bed this is like two in the morning and uh he he comes walk he always walks to his mom's side because katrina pretty much handles the nights right so he i hear him walk in and he walks over and uh mommy mommy and, he, and then he and then she's oh, oh what what max and he's just like i need my water 
And he, we normally have his little thermos that we keep at his bed, and every once in a while we forget. And then he, when he wakes up in the morning or middle of the night, and it's not there, yeah. gets up, and then of course, you know, comes over and tells mommy. And could you could tell Katrina was like out; she didn't want to get up, and so she's. I hear her get her a little water bottle or what like that, and yeah, trying, from yeah, this. yeah. And then he takes like a little sip of it like that, and he's like, "No, I want my thermos." <laughs> you know, he keeps asking for his, and she's like, "No, no, so it's okay, just have that." And so they they kind of go; they're back and forth. I hear them, and. Um, so she's like, okay. So what she does, so this is like classic, like lie to your kid, white lies to like try your lie. She's like, okay, we'll get it, but let's just lay here for a second. And she's, <laughs> she's like trying to get him to do that. So I, she, he goes, oh, it's okay. So he's quiet for like, I don't know, 30 seconds. And then I hear, are you done? <laughs> he asks her, are you done yet, mommy? <laughs> he keeps doing this, right? Like three or four times. So finally I, I, I just get up. I get up, I go downstairs, I go get his thermos. I give it to, I give it over to him and he chugs a bunch of water and then he lays back down. She kind of, she, she cuddles him in. And then I don't know, maybe a minute later goes by and he goes, mommy, let's go to, let's go to my bed. And she's like, she's like, no, 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 let's just, let, let's just lay here, lay here. You can tell she's like so out of it. And he's like, mommy, no, let's go, let's go to my bed. And she's like, it did the same thing as the water trick. Uh, okay, we'll go there. Just uh, close your eyes for a second. <laughs> right. She gave him to do that. Did the same, yeah, thing. did the same thing again. And then Katrina was like, you could hear she's getting frustrated now. She's like, okay. I'm going to take you to your bed and I'm going to lay you down and then I'm going to come back to my room. He goes, okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> the irony though, and she never came back. Yeah, so he won. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, that's a good idea. So that's his new thing right now is that's, that's a good idea. So when someone says something that he wants to do, yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I asked something. him if he wanted to get in the hot tub yesterday. I'm like, hey buddy, you want to go get in the hot tub? Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's he's a, so cute, bro. That video you sent him of, uh, was he coming out of class? Oh, yeah, he came out of class. He's such a lover, man. Oh. I love that about him. He's oh. such a little lover, man. It's cool. So we, okay, so he he came out of class like that, to your point about him being such a lover. So he he comes out of class. He's with these two twin boys. That This school, they have this protocol of you you pull up. We have this like sign that says who our child is, and they bring them all the way out to the car and they bring him in there. You're supposed to kind of stay in there and stuff like that. And so we get to watch him, you know, walk from all the way from his classroom out to the parking lot and we can see him from far away. And it's always so cute. Cause he's like, you know, his, his lunch pell and bag is like the size of he is. And he's always, <laughs> he's always like carrying it, you know what I'm saying? Or dragging you a little hustle in this step. Yeah. 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 And he kind of makes him waddle and yeah. stuff. And then this, uh, this other uh, family pulled up right behind us. They have, they have twin boys who are in his class. And so they, uh, at this time they all came out together and they all came out and all three of them were holding hands oh, as they, as they, cute, as they walked all the way. Are they all was, buddies? They're all best friends? Yeah. Them? I mean, they're just, I mean, I don't even know how close they are as friends. I know they're in the same classroom, but they, they did that. And again, to your point, I think my son has just got that kind of personality. Yeah, lover. We took him to this new school, um, a poor kid or like potentially a fourth school for him before he's even four years old. And, uh, this is the school we really want to get him into. And so we're going to transition him in summer school there. And he's been by there one time to see it. And he met a teacher. We were touring. They had an open house and we were touring there. And the uh, teacher recognized him. She goes, oh, hey, Max. And he saw her and recognized her. And he runs straight up to her and gives her a big hug. And she goes, oh, my God, he's such a lover. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, it's, that's him for sure. He's like that. So I swear he does it too. Katrina uh, says this, that. It's like he knows the people that need it, right? Because mm -hmm. there'll be times he'll be in a room. Oh, be, is, he, is he intuitive like uh, that? Yeah, and there'll be like 10, 15 gift, people, dude. and he'll he'll just randomly go up to a certain family member, and it's always the someone in our family who we know are going through something. Or really? They, yeah, yeah. So it's a trip, right? Wow. So, which I mean, I, I mean, he, his mother is like that, right? So Katrina's mm -hmm. very much so a very in, you're like that in, too intuitive, right? So you think the two of us, right, have yeah. a child, you would think they'd have this kind of uh, you know natural skill. You kind of see that already. And that's nice, so that's man. neat. That's super nice. <clears throat> hey, I was going to ask you, Adam. There was a, some we got some feedback. You wanted us to share. I didn't really read it. Oh, it was the Caldera. I sent it over to Doug. Did you get it? I did. So yeah, yeah I knew we had Caldera coming up, and I had just got a DM like literally two days ago from somebody. Do you have who it is too? Because I, I feel bad. I actually talked about someone the other day. I believe it's Bailey Morris. The screenshot I have is very low resolution. Oh, so it's sorry. super, uh, super low quality. Yeah, yeah. Read what he said. Uh, yeah, so it says, I wanted to thank you and the guys for everything you do. Some of the holistic health resources you guys shared has completely changed my life. One in particular in the show being sponsored by Caldera Labs. I'm 24 now, but as a teen, I struggled with acne, sensitive skin, and redness. It's always been a 
mental hurdle and very difficult to find products that don't irritate my skin. I developed rosacea suddenly and very dry skin ever since I started using the regimen. My skin has looked and feels like it never had any problems. My confidence is high. I can actually live my life without always worrying about how my skin feels or looks. So you know what? You know I saw. It's okay. So I did. Re- I did read that. You know mm-hmm. what's interesting is that skincare products for things like acne oh, it's are typically so designed to kill um, all the bacteria, mm-hmm. right? Because acne, we, we but call they're it always bacteria. like a steroid and like hormone. And then there's that stuff, yeah. right? Um, the thing about Caldera, because it's natural botanicals, it doesn't just annihilate bacteria it creates balance because you need good bacteria just like you need yeah that just like you don't want bad bacteria you want a good balance of bacteria yeah yeah and so what caldera seems to do is create because ba- i noticed the same thing like you know, i've talked about this before my skin's oily justin's skin is, skin is dry yeah. we use the same product and it balances out both of our skin yeah yeah so it has something to do with the, the fact that it balances things out not that it just like pushes Enforces. Some adaptogenic kind of quality to it yeah, a little bit. Yeah, that would be a good yeah. way. To I mean, I, what a what a great you know message though to receive because when I think of our partners and products and the things that we do, it's not I don't expect someone to send like a life changing. Yeah, because Caldera's, but you know, what I'm saying if you dealt with that as a kid, I remember going through. I so I was I had a lot of acne oh. when I was a, now lucky. I just, I just kind of grew it's out of it. Depressing for a lot yeah, of I grew out of it. And I didn't have. Um, you know, I didn't have to take anything. And I just got lucky or whatever that. But boy, my junior senior year, I had like really bad acne. Man, I I, I remember that time in my life, like how insecure you are sure. a, about that. And mm-hmm. so, and then some people it carries into their twenties, and I can't imagine like being in my dating life and having like really bad acne. And so, to have something like that resolved, I mean, God, that is, that is life changing. That's someone, awesome, but not something I would have thought of. For, Dude, no. Did, uh, by the way, have you guys seen the the snow? Up in Tahoe, Bro, Army. snow all over. Do you California. see our Park City house? Our Park, oh, Park City house. City. Is I was like, just going to ask you. It looks it looks crazy right now, dude. It looks so crazy. So the skiing up there must be. Oh, what yeah. what Brooke? I, she posted a, a, a video or picture, and it was like you can almost make snow angels vertically. Yeah, you know, because of the snow. Yeah, yeah. No. So so we haven't talked about this for a while. So we have a place up in Park City, yes. or, or Utah. That we decked out mind pump style. So it's got the PRX gym in the garage. It's got sauna, steam room. Uh, it's got red light therapy in the bedrooms. It's got the Uller. Ullers on the bed. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's all optimized, like biohacking type stuff, optimized. But it's also in a place with like amazing. And, it, and you can rent it. You can go up there, stay up there and rent it. And have all the outdoor stuff plus all the stuff that we talked yeah, about. Yeah, we have we have Juve lights in there also. We have the steam room in there, the movie theater. What we don't have yet is the actual uh dry sauna yet. The dry sauna okay, that's the one is okay. the last piece that we're waiting for. And I think that's coming in, in, in less than a month or so. We and should it's have been that getting up. filled up, but yeah, the last couple of months have been pretty full. But we do have some vacancy coming up, which is uh I'm glad you're bringing it up on the show because we haven't talked about it on the show. So if it's a if it's something you're interested in, one, you get a deal with the Mind Pump uh, if you go through Mind Pump. So it's at the uh, mindpumpparkcity.com. Is that what it is? That's it. Correct. Yeah. And then, um, and what's cool is that for our listeners, when you go, we always set up like a cool little care package. So when you show up, there's like the path water bottles and the, we have uh, Jerry's bundled up stuff with like the net and Organifi. So you get to try out a bunch of stuff. So we try and take care of our people that go there and stay there whenever they go there. So if you uh, get a chance and that's somewhere you want to go yeah, and, and the then it's epic snow right now. To yeah. It's, I mean, of. it is beautiful there. And if you're a skier or snowboarder, it's a great, for sure. A great time in there, but it, it's, there's a wide range in price too. So if you're somebody who wants to experience the house, but maybe can't afford the kind of premium pricing during the uh, ski season, they have downtimes in spring and summer where it's it, it, significantly cheaper to stay there. So if you guys, um, want to stay and, and and experience the house, but then maybe it's a, a little on the pricey side, then book it in advance for later in the spring and summer, and there's a much better deal to go inside during awesome. that time. Yeah. We have a shout-out? How about uh, Dr. Gabriel Lyon? Yeah, let's do that. Shout-out today is to Dr. Gabriel Lyon, one of the smart smartest people in our space. What's her handle? Dr. Gabriel Lyon. That's it? Mm-hmm. Dr. Gabriel Lyon on Instagram. All right, check her out. She's amazing. Check this out. You're not what you eat. You're what you digest. Look, if you eat a high-protein diet like you're supposed to, sometimes digestion can be hard. Well, you can try digestive enzymes that help break down those proteins into amino acids, 
get them to your muscles so you can sculpt and speed up your metabolism. But these digestive enzymes also help break down fats and carbohydrates to help with overall digestive issues. There's a company we work with that specializes in digestive enzymes for people who are fitness oriented. It's called Masszymes. Go check them out. Go to masszymes.com. That's M A S S Z Y M E S.com forward slash mind pump and then use the code mind pump 10 for 10% off any order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Oral Leroy. What are your best tips for beginners? Oh, I love this. <laughs> I would say when it comes to exercise, especially when it comes to strength training, the top two tips I could give someone are this. Uh, practice exercises. Stop trying to work out. In other words, don't go in there and think, I'm going to hammer my legs. I'm going to hammer my chest or my shoulders. Think, I'm going to practice getting better at the squat. I'm going to practice getting better at this bench press. I'm going to practice getting better at this row. Learn the skill of the lift. That'll give you way more uh, in return. And then number two, for at least the first year of training, your number one goal should be to get stronger. Get stronger, practice those lifts. Those two things alone will take you super far when it comes to your strength training. I'll give you uh, a different one. Um, commit to less. It sounds kind of weird, but I was talking to my my dad and his wife this this weekend trying to get them motivated to be consistent with exercise, especially like mobility work because uh, his wife had just had hip surgery and he's got back issues and, you know, and, and talking to family like that, it reminds me of talking to clients when, when I was a, a personal trainer and, you know, all the reasons of why they don't and this and, uh, you know, this and that and knowing I know I need to make a better effort and commitment. And I said, you know, what well, I think what happens is we – you know, you have all this work you need to do. You know, you're not going to, you know, lose 30 pounds of fat in one at, in one go around of training. You know, you're not going to fix your hips in one mobility session. And so I think it just seems daunting for beginners uh, a lot to commit to all of this. And I think what they do a lot of times is overcommit to what they think they need to do to, to move the needle. And so my my thing that I would tell a beginner is, you know, commit to less, commit to something, you know, you can execute and then allow that to, to build momentum. I was telling my dad, I said, dad, listen, and, um, and we got down, I showed him some 90, 90 exercises. It takes you five minutes instead of you like committing to my, one of my maps programs and saying, you're going to do this three days a week, like do that every morning. Mm-hmm. Like start, do, there. start right there. Like that. I know that's going to alleviate some of your low back that's pain and advice. hip issues. Yeah. Start right there and just do that every. Because what I know is, if you commit to that, that five minutes every day uh, for a couple weeks, you're going to start to see and feel a difference from that. It's going to improve your life enough that you'll go, man. That's I only had to commit to five minutes a day to do this, and it's, <clears throat> it's giving me this much payback. What if I spent ten more minutes and I did one exercise mm -hmm. and I just squatted mm -hmm. three times? you know, three sets of, of 10 or something. What if I just did that every other day? I don't even commit to every day. I'll just do that every other day and see what that does for my life. So I think this is a much better strategy and approach than feeling like you have to do so much. And mm -hmm. why this is, this is my advice is because this is something that has even taken me, me a really long time to realize the value of that. And I, I now apply this philosophy to myself. I'm just like I was telling my dad, I said, dad, you know, I play the same mind games too. You know, I said, mine just probably sounds different. You know what my excuse sounds like? It's like, man, I'm 40 something years old. I'm already fitter than 90% of the fucking people. I could skip mm. this week. <laughs> so I justify like that. I make an excuse that oh, I'm already ahead of the, the pack. If I compare mm. myself to the eight, like, so I play the same mental games of making excuses or, and so what I've learned to do is like, you know what? Like, I'm just going to go in the in the garage right now and I'm going to do a, a set of squats. That's it. And what I have found that when I when I commit to less like that that I I'm more consistent with doing something and then something starts to compound and when it starts to compound and momentum builds then it's much easier to be more consistent and consistency is probably the single most important yeah. thing that you can be in this pursuit. Well, I think that's really what I mean, I'm just going to echo everything else we, <laughs> you guys brought up because it's that's taken us decades to figure out in terms of like the simplicity uh, to present somebody that's a beginner 
um, to, to really reduce it down to what you can feasibly commit to. And what does that look like individually? Cause it, it does look different to everybody, uh, based on what they can repeat and, and something that you can string out more of a everyday thing. Like, so it's not cause, cause originally I'd probably would have promoted something more of like a two, one to two to three day kind of thing where it's like, here, you can commit to at least showing up to the gym and do this type of workout. And then, you know, let's start, you know, addressing nutrition. Cause a lot of times, you know, nutrition's another whole complicated can of worms because it's so integrated with your lifestyle and all these other moving parts. And so if we can at least get you moving and build off that moment and then we'll address that. But, uh, I mean, it, it's, it, it's really, it's individually, it could be drinking more water. It could be eating some, some more like cruciferous vegetables and that's it, you know, and then now it's going for walks. And then, you know, now I'm building on that. Like I could do a mobility exercise and, and now I can add in like, you know, push ups, and, and that's, and, and now I have, I have that momentum I can carry into the gym and now I can like get a little more, um, momentum going in towards learning about how to lift weights and what does that look like? And I want to build on the skill of that. So I want to learn how to do a compound lift and maybe I need to hire a trainer to, to be able to work on my technique with that. But it, it starts with like such the, the most simplistic thing that you could feasibly do right now. Yeah. Habits build upon each other and long-term habits, um, n- almost never work when it's more than your capacity to commit to. So it almost never works that way. And wouldn't you say that's probably one of the number one mistakes that people make is yeah. they overcommit to something that Look, they're not going to do. Look here, uh, everybody's started a workout plan in their life, almost everybody. It's The challenge is keeping it, is, is, is maintaining. Now you said something, Justin, that I'll add, um, that if this is feasible for you, one of the most <laughs> valuable things you could possibly do when it comes to fitness and health is hiring an experienced, good coach, experienced and good. They got to be a good coach Mm -hmm. or trainer that right there will improve your odds of success dramatically, Yeah, dramatically. Now you may think it's really expensive. I don't know if I could do that or whatever. Totally understand. But if you took a few hundred dollars and got yourself a trainer, even for four meetings, and just took some of the th- stuff that they taught you and just applied it and practiced it. There isn't a supplement. There isn't a diet. There isn't dinners. There's nothing that could match that investment in terms of what you may be able to get out of it. And if you can invest more, um, I know the success that trainers can produce when they're really good. This is so. such a good conversation because mm-hmm. it's so top of mind. This is yesterday I was having this conversation. And to add to that point, um, I gave them the the Prime Pro webinar dot com uh, thing that I did. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I told him, I said, listen, I've already got this for you to get you going. I said, so if you can commit to this or you guys sit down as you start your morning every day and, and go through this. And we, I literally held their hand to show them how to shoot it up on the screen, everything. So they had it. And my dad's like, oh my God, I didn't know you had this. Like, yeah, it's there. We've talked about it before, but I never like took his hand all the way through that. But I said, here's the deal though. And this is where you have to have the self-awareness. I'm giving you the tools that get you going in the right direction. And I tell you right now, if you make a commitment to doing this, you know, a couple times a week or eventually every day, it will change your life. I promise you that. But you've got to do it consistently. And what I know is that a lot of people struggle with that. So to that point where I think an incredible investment is to pay someone to come to your house, even if it means they're going to do the same shit you could do for free that I have up on that TV, the value of having somebody that that knows what you need to do <clears throat> and that you have an appointment that you're coming to is an incredible investment to build the momentum. So I'm going to challenge you guys first to use it for free and do this because I have the resources, but I want you to have the self-awareness that if you can't even commit to that, then you should invest yeah. financially on somebody coming to you because there's a different type of motivation when you know you're paying out of your pocket for it on the, the likelihood you'll get look, up and do it. I'll argue there's a lot of people, because if you look at training, you know, hiring a trainer, you look at it and you say, oh my God, that's so expensive, right? But people spend more money on monthly cell phone bills. Um, they spend more money on going out to eat. If you get a good coach and a good trainer, okay, so I got to always say that because there's bad ones out there, but you, someone who's experienced knows what they're doing is to train you pro- uh, properly and appropriately. The value you'll get for every dollar you invest in that person, there isn't a single thing that will bring you as much value 
nothing. Nothing will improve the quality of your life, all of your life, like becoming more fit and healthy. It'll make everything in your life much better. It's the most valuable thing you can invest in. So when you look at the price and you say, oh my God, that's expensive, you know, consider the value of what being more fit and healthy can, can do for you and everything. So consider that. Next question is from Synergy620. How do I safely find my one rep max? I have a home gym and get nervous and know I'm not pushing as heavy as I can. I feel like to properly answer this, the first thing that we I or I would want to know is if you're if you're seeking out that for just because you want to, you know, figure out what your one rep is, or you're like competing. Yeah. Otherwise, because, there's no reason, right? Because yeah, because I think that I think that's something we need to make. And I know a lot of programs use the you like know, a percentage of yeah the you know one rep max model uh, to figure out how to guess their way. I've never taught that way. I've never thought that that is a is a unless you're like a a competitor. If you're a competitor in the sport of powerlifting, uh, these types of things, I think is is. Uh, are are valuable um just like i think there's certain weird like understanding sodium and water and and that type yeah, of stuff with body, yeah, day, yeah peaking like body but that makes sense like because you're a, a bodybuilder and you're gonna have to get on stage and present so then you want to be that detailed but if you're the average person who's trying to be consistent with your training program well um this to me you're you're better off learning how to just listen to your body and and make a decision on what you should be lifting for that day or that set or yeah, that exercise. Even, even if you followed one of our programs like MAPS Anabolic, where phase one will have you train the one to five rep range, and you're like, I want to train the one rep range. They're not maxes. Mm -hmm. It's you're, it's a heavy one rep, but it's not one rep max. That's not the way to train. Now, look, if you're somebody who just wants to do it for fun, I get it. Trust me. Believe me. I still will do this every once in a while. Then there's two pieces of advice. I'll, well, three pieces of advice I'll give you. One is there's one rep max calculators that you can find online. They're not entirely accurate, hmm. but they're close. And so here's what they'll do is they'll say, okay, how many, how many, how much can you bench press for 10 reps, you know, max? And you'll type it in there and then it'll give you an estimated one rep max. So that'll give you kind of a general number. It's not exact because some people are actually stronger or weaker in the lower rep ranges in relation to higher rep ranges. So I can lift more than what the calculators usually give me uh, for my, like if I give it what I can do for 10 reps, it'll tell me I can do this for one rep and I can usually do a little bit more, but other people are the other way around, but it'll give you a general idea. Second, uh, practice. Don't practice by maxing, mm -hmm. practice by doing heavy one rep sets. So that'll give you kind of an idea what it feels like. And then here's number three, you're ready to test it out, okay? If it's a deadlift, then go ahead and go for your one rep max. You feel your form break down, let go of the bar. It's not worth grinding out a rep with bad form uh, in terms of the risk of injury. It's just not worth it. So if you're doing it and you're lifting and you feel like your form is good, go ahead. But you start to feel things break down, let go of the bar, you're done. Squats and bench press is where some people get scared because you don't lift the bar, uh, you're stuck. So uh, if you have a home gym with the rack, usually they have safeties. Safety bars, yeah. Use the safety bars, put them in position so that if you do feel your form break down and you need to drop the bar or just get down so that you can get the bar off, you, you can. Otherwise, by yourself, uh, there is a skill and a technique to getting rid of a barbell that you couldn't lift. That is an entire, that's a whole nother yeah, skill. This is a whole nother podcast we yeah. could just devote to how to fail safely. Yep. And I think that's a valuable skill. And this is something, unfortunately, I had to learn through trial and error <laughs> growing up in, in the gym uh, and, you know, trying to to um, get after a lot of these one rep maxes because it was just part of our weight training experience. But um, that, that was something that was... Unfortunately, that's like a, a a valuable. It's a necessary thing to learn, especially if you're going to push yourself to that degree, and you're going to be lifting by yourself. You know, to set yourself up so you're not in a um, position where you're not going to be able to get out of it. Um, so to you know, to make sure you're safe with that. So it, obviously, ideally, you'd have somebody be able to spot you at your house, like if you're gonna if you're gonna pursue this. Uh, and to be able to also like kind of prep yourself to hold a substantial amount more weight than you're used to, at least in, a, in an isometric position, so you can get the real feel, the weight of it, mm -hmm. and acclimate to that. Uh, I I find there's valuable, 
you know, value in that. Uh, so to, if you can, if you can get somebody to kind of come by and at least have you go through that process first, I think that would be, I helpful. like safety is better than a partner. I'll be honest with you because, uh, a partner needs to know how to spot yeah. when you fail. I'm, I've seen same. Yeah. more people get hurt with a squat because they started failing on the squat. The guy comes up behind them, hugs them. The person who's trying to squat form already broke down. Now the person hugging them trying to lift the weight, and they're in the way of them dumping the bar. The only time I ever like <laughs> almost got seriously injured was because I had a, I had a, a spotter doing that and like literally was trying to yeah, and hug and dump put it. Me out. He pushed me forward. And so the weight actually went, crushed me forward with it. And and then I had to like, anyway, I dump it back off of, you know, and almost got him. But yeah, it, it is like, I think I'm with you on that. Like, yeah. I think learning to fail is a lot safer, actually. Yeah, I was a kid and I told the story a long time ago. I, I failed on a bench press and I didn't have collars on the That's bar. That's the hardest one, I think, to, to fail on. There's a technique to it. I can do it really well now. It sucks. You got to roll it down your stomach and sit up and it's mm -hmm. like crushing you. Yeah. But it's not going to, you know, it won't kill you unless you're benching like tremendous amounts of weight. But I, I, I had no colors on the bar as a kid and I failed and I yeah. thought, oh, Just I'll don't go towards your face. No. Yeah. But I thought to my, I pinned it. I was pinned underneath it and I'm at the Y, I'm at the YMCA and I'm embarrassed to yell out help oh. or whatever. So I thought, well, I'm just going to tilt it on one side. So the <laughs> weight slides off. But what happens when you're doing that? It slingshots it. It's sl yeah, yeah. It's the other. Then it went in the other direction. I let go of the bar and it broke the glass. And I never went back to the YMCA again. I signed up at 24 Fitness. I really now. think that you know, for the I I know we're like giving advice on how to do this. I, I think this is so overrated to be honest. Yeah. There, oh there's, yeah. There's no, no, I'm there's with no value. You on that. Like it's, unless you unless you're a, unless you are a competitor for for powerlifting, it's I and uh, honestly, it, it wasn't even a conversation until like the last decade. Like it was CrossFit before mm -hmm. CrossFit. Yeah, CrossFit made made. Uh, uh, PR, yeah. that thing, right? You know, that I, like for the longest time, I didn't even know what PR meant. I mean, I was I was a trainer for at least like seven years mm -hmm. before I even heard the term PR. And then yeah, we, someone, we used to say maxing out. Yeah, you, that's hey, what you max. Yeah, out? what's your max bench or what's yeah, your max deadlift? PR, I don't know where that came. And then from. and then PR Personal became this record. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say? I know what Personal it means, record, but like, right? I, yeah, no, but it was it wasn't a thing though. Like no. nobody really talked about it, and <clears> it's become so popular now. And I know there's going to be somebody who's listening who's going to like, you know, because there's a lot of fitness trainers that use this model to coach and teach. I just disagree with it for the general population. I just think that it's, it's a, it's a worthless metric for 90% of the population. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And if anything, it, you, the, there could the be some psychological person, benefit maybe, but I mean, even then coach them, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you can never, you could never do a single or a double or a triple and you could build the most amazing physique ever. And yeah. so even if you do train singles, doubles, and triples, you're not supposed to do them to max. Yeah. You don't max them. Yeah. You train them at eight, 90%, right? Not max. And That's so, and so if you're the average person, in the general pop and you, you are, and you're in like this person saying like, I'm nervous. And so I'm not sure if I, I, I'm not pushing myself as heavy as I can. If you're underestimating by five to 15%, you you're, it's splitting hairs, dude. Like, let's say like you are a little nervous. So you always. You always go on the little bit lighter side, but you probably could have got another five to fifteen pounds out. So, yeah. so yeah. I mean, if you keep progressively overloading in the program over time, you'll make up for that difference in that week that you could well, have added yeah, five percent. I think the misconception is that um, them being able to achieve this like uh, PR of like a one rep is going to move their progress forward. No, now. it's not the case. It, in fact, most of the time it'll deter you, and you got to come back and that's build right. them back up. That's my exact yeah. point: is that you, for the general population, you're actually by caring more, so much about this. You're actually risking the likelihood. You're more likely to regress in exactly. your programming because learning to like train at this at this high of capacity is really tough and challenging, and you're more likely to overreach or potentially injure and set yourself back right. than than just flirting with Look, being five or ten percent under always, Look, and you, you could progress like crazy. If forever. you want to max out and you want to train to failure, just like in maps anabolic advanced, failure training's in there. It's in the higher rep ranges. There's not lots of value exactly. in failure one rep max training uh, in terms of muscle building. There just isn't. Power lifters, there's some value, but even they program it. Yeah, but it's competitive. Very special way. Yeah. Exactly. Next question is from S Folden85. Should weight be added or reduced for failure sets, or is it hard for six to eight and stretch for 10 to 12 on the fails? Okay. Okay. I think what they're saying is, uh, should I add weight so I can fail at six to eight reps instead of just keep going? To get the ten to twelve, is that is that how you guys interpret it? 
Yeah, I'm still trying should be, to. I mean, out you think they're referring the to the Map Santa Ball Advance? Do you think that's what they're referring to? I right don't know. I don't should know. weight be added or reduced for failure sets, or is it, or or is it hard for six to eight and stretch for ten to twelve on the fails? <clears throat> so, and well, it depends. Are right, if I'm doing if I'm doing a, let's say the programming that I'm following. Okay, so let's assume there are, we don't know what programs. If I'm following a program and the program calls for a rep range then i'm going to add weight to stay there to stay in in that rep range if it's like it maps in a bulk advance where it's as many reps as possible then i'm going to put a, a weight on the bar that i think i'm going to fail somewhere around six to eight but if i don't i'm going to keep going keep, until keep i reps. fail yes yeah. failure training the value isn't going to failure more than the value in the rep range okay now the rep ranges have value but if you look at the studies on failure training, what they find is 25 reps builds as much muscle as 10 reps when they're all taken to failure. Rep training or training within a rep range still, still matters. So I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but it still matters. But it matters more with conventional training when I'm trying to train within particular rep ranges. But let's say I'm trying to do go to failure and I'm at eight reps. I'm like, I think I got more in me. But the purpose of today's workout is to go to failure. Keep going. Keep doing reps. Keep yeah. going to to go to failure. I that's think, where that's yeah. where the value uh, is going to be. And also, I'd like to add this: uh, training to failure. There seems to be more value in the higher rep ranges, like ten plus reps, than in the lower rep ranges. Lower reps to failure doesn't seem to be enough volume for the failure rep training to make uh, that big of a difference. Um, and again, this is just uh, when you look at Maps Anabolic Advanced. We programmed in failure yeah. training, and you'll notice that the rep ranges on those weeks is higher yeah. than on the conventional. The risk weeks. reward ratio with that uh, really swings higher in the risk. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Now that we covered that, that doesn't mean that I actually don't do both of these. Sure. So there'll be times where I'm like, let's say I've been, I've met, let's say I ran a ran a cycle of like very high rep ranges. I've been I've been hanging around the you know 15 plus rep ranges or 12 plus rep ranges. And uh, I know today I'm going to probably uh, fail. I want to I want to try and fail at bench today. Um, but I've been doing the high rep for a long time, and I'm I'm on set, let's say three, and I'm I'm getting the weight that I have on the bar out easily twelve times. So okay, next set comes up. Do I push to fifteen to eighteen reps on that, or am I going to add weight to the bar? Well, that time I'm going to add weight to the bar. It's been a while since I've dropped down to say maybe six reps or five reps. And so the way my brain is thinking this is okay. That's kind of novel for my body because I've been working in this high rep range. I was training, I was planning to train to failure on, on my bench today. I haven't trained anything less than 12 reps in forever. So I'm going to add weight to the bar and probably reduce the reps on that set to failure. If the opposite was true, I just, I've been running like, let's say, a lot of strength training where I'm working with singles, doubles, triples, a lot of five by five training. And I've decided today I'm going to train to failure on chest. And I am in the same scenario again. I'm going to rep out. I'm going to keep the weight the same. And then the final set, I'm going to try and get 15 plus reps. Mm -hmm. And so it's not to say that both of these uh, w ways of looking at this uh, training to failure can't be applied. Both are applicable uh, both have value. We tend to push more towards the higher rep range. I think just the risk versus reward yeah. um, is your for the general population. That's a better strategy, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're saying the other way doesn't work or isn't a strategy. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, so I think that we we push people in a certain direction for the the risk reward and ideal. I think that's where most should go. But if you're an advanced lifter, you understand you got great technique. It doesn't mean there's not value in both of these. My understanding of this question is if I need to fail within 10 to 12 reps, how do I choose the weight? If I need to fail within 10 to Yeah, let's just say it says you're doing failure sets. Yes. You okay. Got, yeah. But I mean, I think I think people are confused on how do I choose the weight if I'm supposed to fail within 10 to 12 reps? You, you, got, you got to guess and then go and then try it. That's the thing about failure training is that if you've never done it before, mm -hmm. it's trial it, and error. it takes a few sets for it's you to a, Okay, so out. there's also another way to, to, to handle this. I think it's so easy, okay? You put a weight on the bar that you feel pretty confident I should be able to at least get 10, okay? I feel confident I can get at least 10. And if for some reason you get to 10 and it feels significantly easier than it should have been, 
I just slow the next two reps way down. Make yourself and take it to failure. That's another strategy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so you sh so if you have a range, I'm trying to get ten to twelve right here. You most of if you've lifted more than a, a month of your life, like you should be able to get an I idea. I can make myself fail with the weight that I could do ten reps with five if I wanted to. That's right. By me too. slowing the reps me too. down, squeezing, and pausing at the bottom. Like yeah. you can make so if you if I and that's exactly how I that's do a this. Great like point. if I put a weight on that I'm supposed to fail within 10 to 12, and I get to 10, and it was pretty damn easy, Yeah. then rep 11 and 12 is going to be a fucking nightmare. It's going to look like this. Yep. You know, and then I guarantee I by, to, I to do by the last one, I'm going to be trembling because I slow the negative down. So instead of like everyone getting so hung up on trying to mathematically figure this out or use calculators, like... Because all that shit is going to change on how you slept, how you ate, how you rest, how all what's going on in your life. That and your tempo. You, using, and, yeah, I mean, I mean the the program itself is advanced, so you should have a good gauge on what your typical like set would look like weight wise. So like if you just bring the weight up just a bit more to challenge that and stress it a little harder, it's not fucking rocket science. If you dude. miss it by three four reps, you're fine. You know. Well, that's another thing too. Is like if you accidentally overestimate on the weight. It's not a big deal if you stopped at nine. That's right. Yeah. Or if you go to 17. Then it prevents you. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's, again, people are overthinking it. Next question is from Riley Feller. What is the best way to cut the sweet tooth? I was raised to always follow a meal with a dessert, and now it's always a craving after every meal. Do you have any detox recommendations, alternatives, et cetera? Yeah. How about this? Eat more protein first, and typically that'll... That'll take care of it. So if you find at the end of your meal, oh, I could have some dessert. Next time you have a meal, eat more protein at the beginning of the meal. And studies show that this can have a pretty pretty big effect on satiety and cravings. That, Proteins tend to do that. When was, I was a kid, I thought I legit had a condition, like a sweet tooth. Like, and I was that, like, I blame was. things on my sweet tooth. Because <laughs> <laughs> people kept saying that, you know? And I'm like, wow, well, maybe I have a sweet I mean, tooth. I totally have a, a sweet tooth and I have an addiction with sugar uh, 100% because of my habits ar around those foods growing up. And I'll tell you a couple of things that have, have helped for sure. I tell you what, my absolute favorite thing about the ketogenic diet was this, was I was blown away on how little cravings for sweets I had eating high protein, high fat, you know, mm -hmm. eating a diet that was pre predominantly proteins and fats. So satiety producing. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, that doesn't mean you need to go to the ketogenic diet, but what that taught me was shifting my macros in a more protein fat direction than a carb heavy. Mm -hmm. So you're more satisfied. Yeah, yeah. Even though my, and, and we talk, and if those that have been listening to the show for a very long time might remember when we all went through the ketogenic diet early on and we all shared our experience with it. And uh, before I went on it, my kind of, you know, joke about it to Sal, I remember telling him like, why the fuck would I do ketogenic? I eat like 600 grams of carbs right now. I get to enjoy all these things in my diet that I love so much. But what I found by going on keto was how much it eliminated all those cravings. And so to this day now, my macro profile is uh, significantly different than what it was just six years ago. Like now I tend to, you know, hover around 200 grams to maybe 300 grams of carbs tops. Mm. And I sh and if I notice that I'm craving more and more sweets, I actually will bump the, the protein and the fats in my diet. And that really keeps it at bay for sure. So will whole foods. So if you, and, and th this is why I don't like protein bars and shakes. Mm -hmm. So as much as, you know, I'm an advocate for proteins, bars and shakes, when you are, you're having a hard time getting enough protein in the diet, and it's sometimes a necessary evil. One of the things being somebody who has a sweet tooth, a lot of those things are all artificially uh, flavored and they kick that craving up. So I'd have a protein bar to hit my protein take, and then I want another one or another one, or I'm cr craving sweets yep. afterwards. It's the experience of yeah. the sweetness. Mm -hmm. If I had to like give like the most generic like pinpoint answer for that, it would have been like, yeah, uh, 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 increase your your protein intake for whole foods, but also get more sleep and drink more water. Yeah, yeah. It'd be like those three things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you what, if you hit your protein target and your fiber target, if your meal has a good amount of protein and you have fiber in it. Watch what happens to your sweet tooth afterwards. Watch what happens to your cravings. It tends to kill it for most people. Now, that being said, if it's purely psychological, in other words, it's not really a hunger craving or a craving due to 
insulin and hormones, then I'd say this, don't have sweets in the house, but give yourself permission to get in the car and go drive to the store and get yourself some. In other words, create a barrier between you and that impulse. And that oftentimes creates enough space for awareness for you to be like, oh, there's that that action I like to take. There's that impulse I like to take. Do I want to or do I not? And it'll stop you most of the time uh, by doing I, that. I really got control of this when I competed because I had to. Uh, and I switched to like all whole foods. And then all of a sudden, uh, fruit tasted like sweets and candy to me. So up until that point, I had never cut processed foods out of my diet consistently uh, until I started competing. And I never thought fruit could taste that amazing. Fruit never tasted. Fruit was very bland for most all my teenage and in and, and 20, 20 uh, through my 20s. And it wasn't until I got 30 did, and I went through my my training for competing and my dieting for competing. And then I was eating all whole foods, got rid of all the process. Rewired your brain. And it did. And then I would, man, I would bite into an apple or a few grapes or some berries. And oh my, it felt like, and then I would do things like berries and and Greek yogurt. And like, there was, there's a lot of like, you know, healthy, uh, you know, sweet recipes that are out there that are with like whole foods and fruits and and Mm -hmm. things like Greek yogurt that made me, that gave me that feeling of eating a dessert. And so that's how I would use And And then it, I it handled that cravings. I would eat one. I'd always still try and do the high, high protein and fat first. If I still felt that, then I would enjoy some of these, you know, whole food treats where I'm eating something like fruit and Greek yogurt. And that completely uh, helped it. But if I allow the processed foods in the diet, um, the sleep is off to Justin's point. Um, that I'm going to, those things are going to be a a battle for me. Look, if you like mind pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free fitness and nutrition guides. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is on Instagram at mind pump. Justin Adam is on Instagram at mind pump Adam. And I'm back on Instagram at mind pump DeStefano. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 